especially with TikTok, people's lives are being changed overnight. People all of a sudden within like a few months got a million followers and they don't know what to do about it. And it's happening more and more and more. And I'm just hearing more about it where people have developed these platforms. They have no idea how to monetize it. And in my experience, I'm having people whose numbers are 10 times the size of mine asking me for help. Like, I don't know. they're, They're like, I've only made like 300 bucks in this space. And I'm like, girl. Hi, this is Tiara Willis, and welcome to Dreams and Drive. Hey, Dream Drivers, welcome to episode 358 of the Dreams and Drive podcast. Today, our guest is beauty influencer Tiara Willis. She started her influencer career at just 14, and now as a 21-year-old Gen Z cultural expert, Tiara leads a community of nearly half a million devoted supporters and followers. Whether she's posting product reviews, inspirational messages, or makeup tutorials, Tiara provides diverse women with honest feedback and entrepreneurship expertise. As a licensed New York esthetician and beauty and skincare influencer, leading beauty and fashion industry giants continue to tap Tiara to lead compelling and influential digital campaigns. And get this, Tiara has been featured in iconic beauty media outlets, including Vogue, Teen Vogue, Allure, Elle, Yahoo News, Pop Sugar, Glossy, Skincare by L'Oreal, Essence, Variety, and more. And on this episode, we're going to be talking about how to make it as an influencer in 2023. Whether you want to be a beauty influencer like Tiara or other influencers, uh, genres, niches, there is so much that Tiara is going to share in this episode that will help you learn how to monetize and really help you learn about how to build your brand. We're going to talk about why she decided not to go to college and the route that she has taken as a Gen Z woman of color in this industry. And I just really think it's really interesting just to hear her unique story and just really showing you the diversity of career paths that are available for young people today and even people of all types, right? I think that it's something that we need to start hearing more, like what's the behind the scenes of what it's really like to be an influencer and how can you make this a sustainable career if you are interested? We're going to be talking about building relationships, the most valuable part of a deal making, how to get your content to perform better. And also we're going to talk about the downside of being an influencer because I think it's really important for us to keep it real on all fronts. So buckle up, stay tuned. This is going to be a great episode. If you're not already following us on social media, please make sure you are. We are Dreams and Drive across the board, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And make sure you sign up for our email newsletter. Just go to dreamsanddrive.com slash join. That's dreamsanddrive.com slash join. All right, let's hear from Tiara. Yes, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I am so excited to have you on. You know, I love talking about beauty. I love talking about influencing and just really learning about how you at 21 years old are just really out here doing the damn thing in this influencer game. So our (laughs) audience is in for a treat today. Yes, I'm super excited to talk about my journey and how I kind of got to this point. So before we get to where you are today, I really think it's important for us to kind of go back in time, right? Um, And think about who we were as young children. So if I could say who was Tiara, the seven-year-old, the eight-year-old, what was inspiring you about the world? Um, You know, I think I grew up in like the internet, my generation, Gen Z. So what I liked about that is I was kind of exposed to things that didn't go on in my daily life. So, and that's kind of what inspired my journey into beauty. Like ever since I was uh, a kid, I was like fascinated with like makeup YouTube and I would like sneak on makeup before I went to school. I would like go in my mom's bathroom and put on her makeup and then I put my glasses on and then try to like sneak it into school. And my mom knew what I was doing and she would have makeup wipes in the car. So before I got out the car, she'd be like, okay, the jig is up. It's it's a wrap for you. So my passion for makeup and beauty definitely just started when I was younger. And that's translated into kind of my career and the field that I'm in today. 
Did you ever think, I know back then, I, I want to say, hopefully not, right? Maybe was that like 15 years ago or wait, not 14-ish years ago, right? There wasn't a thing called influencers back then, but did you have an idea of, I want to be this when I grow up? Actually, no, I never was one of those people that thought I would be in the position I am now. I've always been very introverted. And it's funny because my aunt just believed in me so much seeing me now. She was like, I knew you're going to be like this star. I knew you're going to be on, like doing what you're doing now. But I never felt that way about myself. I've always been introverted. I keep my head in my books. And that was just not what I thought. I was going to end up doing, I think my stream was, I know I'm going to go to a good school. Like I always thought I want to go to Harvard or something. And I was like, maybe I'll be a lawyer, but I didn't necessarily have a vision of what I wanted to do. I just knew that I was smart, that I was good at school. And I kind of thought that far, but I never thought that I would be in the beauty space speaking on camera for a long time on my platforms. It didn't even show my face. Because that's just not who I am. I'm not very extroverted. I don't like being in the forefront. So it's funny that now that's kind of all what I do. And I love it. It really brought me out of my shell. And because I started so young at 14, it really shaped who I am now. I want to go back to that because I think a lot of people might identify as introverts, right? But then how do you still succeed as like, in these extrovert type roles, although you don't have to be a, you know, extrovert to be a great beauty content creator. Also, just because you're not like creating content to the masses, right? You're, you're at home by yourself in front of a camera. And once you put it out, like, it's not like you're there live doing it. So there might be a way to go get around that, especially if you are introvert. So we'll come back to that. Let's go to 16 years old. So you graduated from high school with high honors early. What was like, was that the plan or was it just, did it just kind of happen? So I've always had good grades my whole life. I've always just been smart and just excelled in school. To me, school was just pass your test, get good grades on your test and do your homework and, and show up. And that was like my formula to success. So I always did my homework. I made sure I was going to class and I studied really, really hard for tests. I'm big. I'm a good test taker. So I always did well in school. I always excelled at different things, putting in special math classes and, you know, performing the best in my class and things like that. But when it came to high school, I started my career when I was 14. So I just started high school. It was it was the first semester of my freshman year. And within about three months, I realized that this could be a thing for me because the platform took off so fast. I was hitting like 10,000 followers within three months. I was building deep relationships with brands. My account was being featured in different headlines because of the things that I was saying and just how innovative the platform was, right? During that time, Girls that looked like me were not being properly represented and the account Makeup for Women of Color was birthed out of that frustration. So once it was created, so many women of color identified with it and it really just built this community. And once I realized that, I figured out that the traditional route of going to college and getting a degree was not something that I wanted to do. And I decided that school was kind of hindering me. And I wanted to get out of there as fast as oh, possible. Wow. Did, how yes. do your parents feel about that? Um, they felt a way about it. I mean, my mom did not go to college either. Like she bootstrapped her way up in work. So she was used to that kind of mindset and just getting a trade and not necessarily pursuing a degree. But I definitely got, you know, some pushback from well-meaning, you know, friends and Uh, family because I had such good grades and actually got a lot of pressure from my principal and guidance counselors. They like heavily discouraged me from doing what I wanted to do. And my mom and I had decided this, I think when I was about my freshman year or my sophomore year, where I actually wanted to go to BOCES, which is a program, at least in New York, where half the day you go to school and the other half you pursue a trade. So I wanted to go to school for cosmetology naturally. And they basically barred me 
from going. The school they, or your, your They high barred school. me from school. Yeah, my school, the, my high school kind of barred me from going. My principal, she basically said that I was like too good for BOCES. Like I was too smart and this is for delinquents and people that are not going to graduate and all that stuff. I went to a very like predominant white school. So BOCES was kind of like something for kids they think think thought we're not going to do well. And my school actually wasn't listed on the BOCES website because of how taboo it was. So here I am, someone with high honors and was very active in diversity and inclusion in my school. I really became a spokesperson from that. And I'm sitting with my principal and, you know, the people with a lot of authority in school. So I'm doing all these things. So seeing that I want to go to trade school was just like crazy to them. So I had actually wanted to do BOCES and I wanted to graduate early. And they were very upset by that. So when my mom actually asked, what if we went over your head? What if we pursued BOCES over you? And my principal said, I'll never forget that she was like, I would not support that. And that just like stuck with me. Like she was not She was not having it. So we compromised in that I would graduate early. So basically what I did was I did my junior classes and my senior classes in one year. And that's just the route that I did. And what I learned through that experience is that most of us actually graduate with excess credits that we need in school, right? The state determines how many credits a student needs to graduate. And oftentimes we have more than what we need. So it actually was not that difficult, at least in my experience, to graduate early because I had already deemed or received all most of the credits that I needed. So only thing I needed to do was two English classes and two social studies classes. And I took an elective and actually still had a free period because of how all kind of worked out. So I was really happy to graduate early because I knew that this is what I wanted to do and I didn't want to go to college. And because of that, I was always in the principal's office, the guidance counselor's office, always trying to convince me. And every time I would see my principal in the hallway, she would like come after me. So me and my friends started like, yeah, so me and my friends started ducking her because she was always like coming and just trying to discourage me from what I was doing every time I saw her. So it was definitely difficult because I wasn't taking that traditional path, but I'm so glad I did it. I For me, in my experience, and maybe just for my generation, that traditional route, I find, just consumes not only money, it's very expensive, but then also your time and distraction. So I'm glad that I took the route that I had and pursuing a career that I already was successful at. It didn't make sense for me to go to college to get a job when I already have a good job. So that's kind of the route that I took, and and I'm really glad that I did it. It wasn't easy, but I'm really happy with that. And I still knew I wanted to do something after school, like either take business classes or maybe graphic design. Um, But I ended up doing aesthetic school because I had slowly began a passion for skincare. And then also under aesthetics, I can get my makeup license. So I, I went through that and that really added to my platform. And that's something I really wanted to do. I wanted to get some type of trade or some type of certification that would add to my business. Do you think that schools are doing students a disservice like your like students like yourself a disservice when they're not really encouraging alternative pathways? Cuz like you said like why were they making it so hard when you clearly had a plan, right? And I feel Girl, like this next generation is this money. next But was it a public school or private school? It was a public school. Okay, so like they weren't even you said money is the issue? It's money. They make how like their graduation rate, like the amount of students that are going to college, that attributes to the funding that they get. And right, that also attributes to their salaries. Yeah. So the more students that are going to college, especially prestigious colleges, the, the school may benefits off of that. And not to say there aren't well-meaning people that want to see students succeed, but at the end of the day, in my opinion, it really just comes down to money. And that's why there's a huge push for students to graduate and go to college. Yeah, because but they don't think about the debt. Like I know people who come out of these four year institutions and just have hundreds and thousands of dollars of debt. And it's like for what? When you're not even making Yes. 
You're not even making that much in these entry level jobs, yes. right? Yeah. And also too, my classmates at this point are graduating or have already graduated. And just speaking to them, they still don't necessarily know what they want to do. And the degrees that they got don't and aren't related to the career they necessarily have. So you have a lot of students who check the box of getting into a good school, but nobody talks about the after. Like, what are you taking in school? A lot of times, like people will take courses the like psychology, nothing wrong with psychology, but I find that kids that don't know what they want to do, they often take psychology because it's an interesting course, not that they necessarily want to end up being a social worker. So I think it was just a lot of focus on the school that you got into. And there was a special day in school where you would wear um, a shirt representing the college that you got into. So me, I ain't have no shirt to wear because I was going to college, but you saw kids walking out with Stanford and Penn State and all of these, you know, Brown and all these different schools. And I didn't have no shirt because I was not doing that. But that's how much of a push it is to go into college, at least in, you know, in my experience. But then talking to these kids who got into a really great school, they aren't really knowing what they're doing in school, their degree, and they end up doing something totally unrelated to what they went to school for realistically. Hey, Dream Drivers, y'all want to be inspired today? You got to meet the 2023 McDonald's Change Leaders, 10 young people who are working to make change in their communities. All year long, McDonald's is helping them level up and spread the word about what they're doing. And they're up to some impressive stuff. Writing books that teach our babies to love our history, challenging our ideas about autism, and a lot more. These young leaders are on it, y'all. Check them out at MCD changeleaders.com Hey Dream Drivers ever since becoming a mom life has changed for me in so many ways and I've learned so much about what it takes to be a mother one of the things I realized early on in this dream driving journey was how important having the right tools aka diapers in my toolkit is when it comes to changing those dirty diapers for me it's all about making the smartest choice I need reliability and quality and Pampers gives me that you may save a couple cents on other brands, but will you save time and convenience? Who wants more leaky diapers, more laundry because poop stains are not fun? And better yet, diaper rash? Not me. I don't worry about that with Pampers. There are other things you can save on, but honestly, your baby deserves the Pampers experience. I've sworn by Pampers with my son for the past two years. It's gentle on his skin, and I can trust that they can hold up throughout usage. As a busy dream driver already juggling so much, your diaper's choice should be easy and worry-free. Make sure you download the Pampers Club app today to start earning free diapers. Let me ask you this. As a Black woman, right, I feel like, do you ever feel like, how did you build that confidence to kind of say, I'm not going to college? Because I, I feel like as Black women, right, we often, we're like, you're supposed to do it. You're doing it, for, you're not doing it for you, you're doing it for your legacy, you're doing it for your people. So there might be an yeah. added pressure just from like society in general. Like, how dare you, smart Black woman, not live up to your potential, right? Yeah, absolutely. And at one point, I actually considered going to community college. Because one, I was just like, if I'm going to go to college seriously, I'm going to do my two years of community college and transfer to save money. Like that's actually the smarter Mm -hmm. way to do it financially, but people don't think about that. But once I told people that I wanted to go to community college, it was like, are you crazy? (laughs) Like, are you nuts? Um, and, And people just, just the way that we view school and alternative routes for education is is can just be really discouraging sometimes so for me i had to really focus on what am i doing well at and what can i do to further add to this what support can i add to this realistically is going to college support what the path i'm already on what i'm doing well i said no it wasn't, it wasn't helping. So instead of focusing so much on like tradition and what you're necessarily supposed to do, I decided to be realistic with what I had. So let's talk about that 14 year old really quick, because I want to just make sure I'm understanding the foundation by which you built your brand. So you were 14 and were like, mom or whatever, I want to make a YouTube channel. Did you start out on YouTube? Talk to us about the beginning stages of your content and you know, how you were able to really figure out your niche and then grow from there. 
Yeah. So I started when, for, when I was 14. I actually started on Twitter, which a lot of people find surprising, but that's actually my biggest and most interactive platform. And I feel like Twitter was made for introverts because it's nothing about what you look like necessarily. It's about your words. Mm. So how you communicate the stories you tell, how do you uh, create conversation and that's just something that I excelled at was talking to people and asking questions and w- like having my voice. So I really started on Twitter because I felt like that was an outlet for me to not only discuss the things that are bothering me within the beauty space, but then also connecting with others who also needed support and also provided education. Like we really just formed a community and built off of each other. So I started doing that when I was 14. And eventually now I've extended into Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, LinkedIn. But I really started when I was 14. And I just always had a passion for makeup. I really loved doing it. And why I started specifically was because I was doing so much research on makeup. Like whenever I'm into something, and this is something I'm known for, I go hardcore. Like I was doing my makeup every single day, practicing, watching YouTube. I would take notes and go to the store and buy the things (laughs) that I saw. So I ended up becoming like the go-to girl for all of my friends. Like they're coming to me for advice. So I was just like, man, let me just create a platform for my friends so that they could tap into that and have all in one space. And then I found out that a lot of people want that and my audience just grew so much and they also grew with me because again, I was still in high school. I was going throughout the phases of my life during that time. So it was definitely an interesting experience. And then in regards to my parents, I did not tell them about my platform until I got my first check. Because wait, so you wait, technically you were underage doing this, right? Or- I, yes, I was underage. I did not even have a checking account. Like that's how complicated it got. So I only told my parents when I was forced to, where I was like, this mom, this company wants to give me thousand dollars and I don't know what to do with it. And she's like, why didn't you tell me about this before? And I'm like, I don't know, but I don't know what to do. So we had to like figure that out. So figuring out how to start a a checking account at Chase and then also thinking about, okay, do I need to get an LLC? Like, how do you even set this up? Like, what do you do about taxes? I don't understand this. So we ended up using this platform where you can kind of get your LLC from and filling all of that out. So I had this paperwork and then I go to the bank to open a business account. And the person working at the bank said I was too young to open a business account. She said that business accounts for kids are only for like child actors and child stars. Well, you were a star, you, right? Weren't you a star? But for <laughs> you, this would not apply to you. And she said, I don't know why that platform allowed you to open a business. That's what she said. I don't know if that's correct, but that's just what ended up happening. So for those years where I didn't have an accountant and I was just really bootstrapping and figuring things out myself, it it really was a moment of growth. And now being 21, the education that I have in regards to specifically business, like far precedes my peers just because of how I really had to be in it, how I had to figure it out myself because I was getting paid and I didn't intend to get paid at all. Like that was not my intention to form a career out of this. I was just doing it for fun because I love makeup and I wanted to talk, but I had no intention of making money and having this be a career. So once this started happening, the saying that more money, more problems was really true because it really like erupted my life. And I was getting all these packages sent to my house and my parents were like, this is ridiculous. Like (laughs) there's boxes all the time over here. This is too much to recycle. I remember one time we went on a cruise for my family. And then by the time we got home, there was this mountain of packages in the door. And one of them from this band was a massive lollipop. Oh my gosh. (laughs) And my parents were like, this is ridiculous. So it it was such an interesting time and it was such a unique experience. But I I off, during that I was I figured out that this is what I wanted to do. Like look at look at the path that I'm on. I I am in such a different lane than my peers. I really want to pursue this. 
No, that's so interesting. And I love that you were able to give us that background because I didn't even know that there were caps from the age you had to be to start an official business. I don't know if that's true, but that's what I was told. She, The woman literally laughed in my face. She was not nice about it either. She pretty much called us stupid. Um, but it's like you have but, a yeah, legitimate income, right? It's just... So you had to kind of find yeah. out work, workarounds. And I, we were, had okay. to work around it. <laughs> I I don't even want to speak because I don't need certain agencies coming after no, no, me. No, no, no. I understand. I understand that. But, <laughs> so, but you, you made it. You figured out how to make it work for what yes, you Yes, and to now do. I have an incredible team. I've hired people that are true experts at this, and they are amazing and so valuable. And while I know a lot, I understand the need to delegate as a business owner and to hire people that are better at this at certain field at in certain fields than than I am so what were brands coming to you to like what was their pitch to you when they were reaching out like what did they want you to do for them during this early time period so I would talk a lot about products that would work for women of color and especially black owned businesses so I would talk about hey, here's this foundation line that would work for us, or here's a Black-owned eyeshadow brand. And what would happen is people would start buying these things. It would go viral. People start talking about it. So brands would reach out to me saying, hey, we want to put this product in your hands. That's the whole point of getting PR packages because you're more likely to talk about something when it's already gifted to you. And then two, they also um, had me sign up for their affiliate program. So things where Influencers say, oh, use my discount code, da, 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 use code TR for 10% off. I was making commission off of that. And having that financial incentive makes influencers want to talk about your product more. So I initially started mostly with PR packages and um, influence affiliate marketing. But then at the same time, I was sending pitches. I was putting in the work. I was fig- I figured out how to network. I figured out how to write a pitch. I figured out how to find contacts. Like I was doing the work. So now in 2023, because of all the work I did in high school, when I was sitting on the bus, I would be on my phone, mm. looking up trends, finding emails of different managers, writing out pitches. Like that's all I did after school. So now I really see the fruit of my labor, but not only was it from my organic content that got me recognition from brands, but I was also putting in the work for if they're not seeing me, if they're not seeing the results that I'm getting and the money that they're earning from the content that I create, I'm going to put myself in front of their face. So I made sure to talk about my mission, my analytics, who I am, what I do, why I'm important, why you should work with me, who I've worked with in the past. I really mastered how to write a pitch. And now because of those things I did in the past, I've really built amazing, beautiful relationships with different brand managers that, you know, benefit me and them today. So what do you think a lot of, you know, influencers or content creators in this space are doing wrong when it comes to pitching brand deals? Because I feel like a lot of people now think that, oh, the the market is oversaturated. You might hear that a lot, right? I work yeah. my nine to five. I work in the brand partnership space and we work with talent a lot. And, you know, there is a lot of talent that you can bring in for d- certain deals, but sometimes you want to work with certain people and, you know, we know their budgets, you work with their ages and stuff like that. But what do you see from your point of view about what you think your peers aren't really paying attention to and what makes you stand out from them? Yeah. So actually I'm coming out with a masterclass specifically for this um, in this month. Um, it's called Securing and in- negotiating brand deals, like how to get the bag. Um, And it's going to start a new series of how to really figure out your place in this space, especially specifically for creators of color for many different reasons. But one thing I will say that influencers get wrong is they are amazing creatives, especially in this generation. They're very focused on their self-expression, which is amazing, but they forget that this is business. You're talking to major corporations. So while you're on Instagram and TikTok, why aren't you on LinkedIn? Why aren't you at corporate events? Why aren't you at marketing um, conferences? That's where you need to be. So not just so much of your craft and your, you know, your art and your creativity, but you have to recognize that you are working with people that work nine to fives, people that are million dollar corporations. You have to talk business to them. You need to 
go on their LinkedIn, find their personal pages. You need to figure out how to write a good pitch. And we talk all about this um, in topic four and five of my class, pitching and then also negotiation. And then topic three is networking. But that is super important. It's not just about the art you create and the content you create. That's actually a very small part of the career. I tell people making the videos is 30% of the job. 70% is running a business. So that's one thing creators forget is that, you know, the videos that you make while they're influential and super important, you have to remember that this is a business and you're working with other businesses and basically, you know, creating a partnership. Dream Drivers, Walgreens knows you need your medications, but sometimes what you really need is a prescription for more time with your family or friends or just more time to do what you want on a Saturday afternoon. That's why Walgreens offers same-day RX delivery to where you are. So you can get more than just your meds. You can get your prescription to save time at the pharmacy. And when you have pharmacy questions, which let's face it, we all do, Walgreens will be there for you with a helpful 24-7 pharmacy chat. So when you need to know, which med do I take before bed again? Or is it safe to have a glass of wine with my prescription? You can ask a Walgreens pharmacy expert that question no matter where you are or what time of day it is. And that gives you more than just answers. It gives you your prescription for peace of mind. Delivery is available on eligible prescriptions only. See details at walgreens.com slash prescription delivery. Whether you're searching for the latest sneaker drop, that iconic handbag, a timeless watch, or your next piece of classic jewelry, eBay authenticators are there verifying every detail of your purchase. Yep, we're talking each inch, stitch, tick, facet, and claps that make the piece you're searching for worthy of your collection. eBay authenticators are experts in their craft, true connoisseurs, and as leaders in their fields, they're making sure your items always arrive as authentic as your style. So go ahead, get that piece you've always wanted, and leave it up to the meticulous eyes of an eBay authenticator to make sure that watch movement is original, that glimmer is real gold, that rare sneaker is legit, or that handbag is really made of genuine leather, and never get faked over again. In a world full of fakes, it's time to get real with eBay Authenticity Guarantee. Everyone deserves real. Visit ebay.com for terms. You know, one thing that I often hear a lot is people are like, but you know, Tiara, I just don't have that many followers. Or you have hundreds and thousands of followers. I only have 2,000. Can I still get a brand deal? Yes. So I talk about this specifically because I hear all the time because I've already provided a lot of free education on how to make money in the space. And that's one of the comments that I get the most is, well, I don't have as many followers as you. And what we specifically talk about in the class is one, your content itself is valuable. So oftentimes and where I actually make the most income is through licensing and usage rights. And Ooh, while we get excited. Yes. So whenever I'm signing a contract, the immediate thing I look for is I go to the licensing section because that is the most valuable part of the deal. Basically, what that means is the brand owns your image for a period of time. And oftentimes they're asking for something called in perpetuity, which means they want to own it forever. (laughs) Yes. So that is actually worth a lot of money. Oftentimes it's worth a lot more than you just posting it. For example, I've had a brand deal where um, I made, I signed off for $17,000. $3,000 was just for posting it. Fourteen dollars went towards being used on the show, being used on their website, on their social media. That's actually where I make the most money. And even after I do a brand deal, oftentimes a brand will come back months later saying, hey, we really love the video that you made, can we actually buy it for like three months to use as an advertisement on Facebook? So then that doesn't matter how many followers you have, right? If you are making good content, if you are making something that converts into sales, you can make a very well sustainable income for yourself, regardless of the amount of followers you have. And one way to figure out how to do that is making sure Your content is in alignment with the brands that you want to work with. And we talk about this also in the class where you need to create a brand. So 
write down a list of like who you want to work with and what niche you're going to be in. So for me, I work in makeup and skincare. So I have a list of brands that I dream of working with and I do research on them. So I look at the content that they create, that they repost, and I try to emulate what is already working or what they seem to already be interested in. So because of that, since I'm already in alignment with the content they create or they prefer, because every brand has their idea of how they want to represent themselves, we're already in alignment. So then when I create the content or secure the deal, they are generally interested in wanting to agree to usage rights. So that can actually make a big part of the deal. And I've seen a lot of micro influencers create a very well income because of how valuable the content they create and and the value it brings. And then also to what you want to make clear in your brand is not only, you know, you make nice videos, but your mission. Why are you different on the internet? What makes you stand out? Why are you here? And if you have a significant story, if something's different about you, that is so attractive to brands because they always want some type of bigger message than just selling a product. No, I think that's so important. And one thing that I I love that you mentioned, what I'm taking away from it is you have to really understand the bigger picture of the business of beauty. And I think, like you said, a lot of creators, they like the creative part of it, but the people that get ahead are the ones that either have a team that knows the bigger business Or if they're digging deeper and they're doing the unsexy things to get the sexy money, because licensing and image and usage rights, that's something that you would not know unless you're reading your contract, right? Unless you're having someone review it, unless you're thinking about, so how is the brand making money? Or how is the brand, how is this of benefit to the brand? So if you're listening in, whatever industry you're in, there's probably a deeper part of the business that you're not understanding that you can get a better understanding of. And then you can figure out how you can tie that to your own revenue streams. Another big thing that I know, because back in the day, I'll say back in the day, right? When I first graduated from college, I used to write for a lot of online, you know, websites like Madame Noir. And there was this, this website called called Stylecaster. I I forgot what it was yes, called. Yes, that was actually my first press feature was in Stylecaster, funny Yeah, enough. it was just like, you know, a lot of these like sites, I don't even, some of them aren't even around anymore, but I used to brand myself as like a beauty writer, right? So as a beauty content creator, back in the day, beauty writers are really coveted, right? So I would get all these press and PR packages myself, but I wasn't really a creator. I was more so just talking about the business behind the brand and that kind of stuff. But a big thing for me was relationships. And I think people don't understand, like you said, the people behind the scenes making and cutting the deal, sending the PR packages are people, right? Who want to get their job done effectively. So if, if I know Tiara, you're reliable, you respond to all my emails, you're gonna give my brand a shout out. I'm going to keep on talking to you, right? So talk to me, maybe if you have an example of a relationship, you don't have to mention the brain if you don't want to. Yeah. But a time where a relationship that you really nurtured helped your overall growth and brand. Yeah. So I can give a few examples. One that I started really uh, young with, and I actually was able to shoot with them. This was Maybelline, actually. I remember leaving school early to go do a shoot with them. I spent all day at their headquarters um, in New York. We filmed a really nice YouTube video. We took content for social media. And I worked a lot with Sarah Mendelson. And we really just grew a really nice relationship. And you know, are very friendly with each other. And also, too, within the beauty space, especially under major corporations, the, these people hop around. They'll be working yeah. here one the year agency, and we're there. You know, yeah, the so they're always agency. popping around. So, you know, building those relationships and also being genuinely interested in them. So like following their Instagram, like commenting on their posts goes such a long way and just being nice and being friendly and being down to earth. Whenever I go to influencer fr- events, while well, I love talking to my colleagues, I'm streamlining to who's ever working there. So in building that contact, I'm like, okay, what's your phone number, girl? Like, that's what that's what I do um, in regards to networking. So really building those strong relationships. But then also what you talked about is how does the content or how does the brand deal go along? So one thing I like to do is um, under promise and over deliver. So say the brand... 
I will say the brand, hey, I'll get this done by Thursday. I just try to get it done on Monday. So I try to be very efficient in things that I do. And on my website, I also talk about my turnover. I mostly can get things done in two weeks. Um, and I'm pretty responsive because of the brand team that um, I have. And, and we really just built that up. And But I will say that I am more efficient or better at my job when I have help. So having a manager or having an editor or things like that and having assistance, that actually helps improve the brand relationship. Because if you're doing everything by yourself, I may not respond to your email for a little <laughs> bit. It's, it's just a lot. It gets very overwhelming. So I've actually found in order to better nurture my relationships and focus on what I actually need to do, it's also delegating work, which I think a lot of people don't talk about as a business owner, where if you want to grow your relationships within you know, your field or your niche, you probably need more assistance on the back end in order to fully dive into that. And then I also find too, we talk a lot online, emails and like Instagram, but what I find the most beneficial is in-person conversations and dinners and events. I have grown deeper relationships with managers that I talk to in person and we talk about my ideas and how I think the brand could evolve and how they could perform better. And I've built so many relationships with different CEOs of million dollar companies because I've always just been a big support to them from the beginning and sending them ideas. I think this would be great for you. And I love this about the app or, or whatever. And I think you guys could do better with this. And not only just trying to get something out for myself, but how can I add to this person's life? How can I improve their experience at their job or the company that they own? So not only trying to be like me, 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 but also how can I better serve you? Yeah, people work with people that they like, point blank period, right? Like yes. if they have a genuine connection. So true. Them, yes, and I hear that all the you. time. It's so true. I've I've had um, another experience at another million actually billion dollar company, someone that was working there. And in the creator team, we actually became super friendly and I just adore her. And what she told me was that whenever we're doing a project or something, I mention you mm -hmm. and I put you first because I like you. Like I like who you are as a person and these other people, I, I just know that I like working with you. I like the results that you bring and you're just pleasant to work with and you also give us you know a great ROI but those relationships and just being kind and being personable and being down to earth and then also thinking of how you can add to their life and, and their career and their overall you know experience in the corporate space really goes a long way. You mentioned ROI and I just want to talk about that quickly. What do you do if you feel like you're a great content creator. You're creating great content, but your ROI isn't there, right? Your influ your 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 in your audience isn't interacting. They're not buying. Is there something? Is that a sign of you, the creator, right? Or is there something else going on? So one thing I think all of us need to acknowledge in this space is that sponsored content is never going to perform as well as organic content. It's just simply not. Yeah. Um, that's just always the case across the board. And I think as influencers and then also on the brand side, we just need to understand that. But two, a lot of times brands may not understand what works best for you and how you bring in sales. They focus on what they like. So they want this type of content. They want these certain words. They want it on these certain platforms. But for you and your audience, your community, you there are maybe other routes that are more effective. So when I find on the platform that I'm using and it's not gaining what I thought it was, even though I knew that it was probably going to end up like that, I use my other platforms to see how I can support those things. So, for example, in most brand deals, you're being given a tra uh, tra traffic link on, mm -hmm. you know, what's going in, the metri metrics and stuff like that. Not only, you know, the analytics for the post itself, but then also who's clicking that link, who's buying it through those things. So if it's only like an Instagram deal, I will try to put that on Twitter or I'll try to garner more interactions organically through other platforms. So I will post a sponsored video on another platform where it's not sponsored because I want those clicks. I want that engagement. 
Also, too, just understanding your value and your worth and not second guessing yourself and realizing that this brand wanted to work with you for a reason. So, you know, this one video didn't perform well. You have proven yourself to other brand partners, to the media that you are exceptional. So I try not to let one deal really discourage me. I try to find other incentives that I can add to that. So maybe doing something different than what I agreed to on the Instagram stories. Because every brand, you know, has a requirements and certain things. But while they want me to do this one thing, I know I would get better traction by doing something else that they wouldn't necessarily approve of or wouldn't be a part of the cre- creative creative brief, something totally different, like adding it to reviews already done. Or maybe I'll start spotlighting my followers that have agreed with my recommendation. That's not something I could put in the sponsored post, but by pushing that, that's going to help better improve the traffic on, you know, that unique link. Mm -hmm. So just using different avenues of things I work well that the brand necessarily wouldn't approve of just because of their guidelines that they have to follow, I think can help those times where your content isn't performing um, how you'd like. And then also letting your followers know like, hey, I have a sponsored post up and I know you love me and support me. Do you mind (laughs) like just going and saying something? And people will. A lot of my followers people work with people they like, right? My followers ride for me. They are super in touch or just supportive of what they want me to do, at least, you know, financially and career wise. For example, when I'm creating organic content for a brand, they're the ones that I like. So when are you going to sponsor her? (laughs) Like, when are you going to do something with her? So when I get a brand deal for a brand that I are already, you know, obviously believe in, they're so excited and happy for me. And so maybe just giving gentle reminders of, you know, supporting that sponsored content, I think will be helpful when you give people a mission, because for the most part, like all of us, we just scroll and scroll and scroll. So if someone that you like is like, hey, do you mind supporting me on this? They're more likely to engage. So Tiara, you seem like you, you are just so inspiring. And you are just really blowing the game away with all that you're doing what's something that you're struggling with in the brand like what's a challenge right now as you're growing right you're seven years in who knows how many more like you know there's just more to be done more to be accomplished but what's something right now that you're working through and how are you working through it definitely work-life balance I would say is my biggest enemy which is funny. I think I, I'm very good at what I do. I get that compliment a lot. Like you are good talking. at work. I love you. It. Are good at work. You excel. Like you will. You will never be lazy. We know that about you. But I don't play hard. I work hard, but I don't play hard. And that has kind of always been the attitude that I had when I first started. When I was in high school, right? That's really a part that shapes who you are that you know are developmentally so when I was in school I never spent any of the money that I had I never went out and bought this and bought that or all these nice things I saved it and I just built and built and built I kind of got a, a use to that that I never actually got to enjoy the fruits of my labor and that can lead to burnout that can be impacts on your mental health or it can actually affect your performance but then also your overall joy in what you're doing not just in work but in your life so one thing i'm struggling with or one thing i'm trying to work on is just that balance so taking breaks going on vacation buying something nice for myself if i secured a really good deal celebrating that um and then also just congratulating myself on some things because definitely as entrepreneurs we struggle to see the rose to smell the roses we're always focused on the next thing the next milestone what can i do what can i do more and we don't stop to appreciate the things that we've already done and to enjoy all of the work that we put in so that's definitely um my goal for this year and i've in, in different areas, I've learned to simplify and not be so hard on myself. And then also delegating more work and more responsibility and building my team. That's what I've been doing this year and last year is hiring more people because that helps us take the load off um, on me personally. And then you can do what you're really good at and then have that time to actually relax. 
Um, you know, one of the things that I want to make sure that I talk to you about is like you've been, I feel like seven years ago, the industry was totally different. You probably know that, right? And you've kind of been in the industry while it's changed. I feel like now it kind of is a creator influencer economy, especially in the beauty space. Where do you think the industry is moving towards? And then how do you think creators like yourself, influencers like yourself can make sure they're on that boat to the next wave? Yeah. So for me, in my experience, I found that it was like makeup and skincare started peaking. So my platform naturally transitioned just for me personally and in my interests developed that way. But then I found that the industry as a whole uh, in the beauty space, it started going in that direction. Now we see more brands watching skincare lines, specifically celebrities, like they're not doing makeup or perfume, they're doing skincare. And even in hair care, you're seeing skincare related ingredients. So skincare is definitely at the forefront right now. I would say it still is. But I think what we're slowly going to transition to is more entrepreneurship. And people that have built these careers, I think they're going to do more work in the professional side and talking more about money and finance and just their job as a creator, because a lot of people want that life. A lot of people want to know how to do this. They don't want to be at their nine to five anymore. They want to make videos Mm -hmm. and even just children in general, they don't want to be astronauts or doctors. They want to be a YouTuber. That's so So crazy to me, right? Like it's just like this, this career was not when I was growing up, like that wasn't even something you thought of. Like what? YouTube? You make a life living off the internet. Is it sustainable? I mean, that's the things I would think about now, right? But continue. Sorry for for cutting in. It's okay. Yeah. So I think there's going to be more discussions about back end. And I'm really excited for my masterclass because that's something that I want to tap more into because especially with TikTok, people's lives are being changed overnight. People all of a sudden within like a few months got a million followers and they don't know what to do about it. And it's happening more and more and more. And I'm just hearing more about it where people have developed these platforms. They have no idea how to monetize it. And in my experience, I'm having people whose numbers are 10 times the size of mine asking me for help. Like, I don't know. know. they're, They're like, I've only made like 300 bucks in this space. And I'm like, girl, like I've literally been on the phone with mothers calling me about their teenage daughter who has millions of followers on TikTok, but isn't making any money. Like I've sat on the phone, I've texted like for hours, sending resources and helping because it's just such a common experience where people have the platform, but they're not being uh, compensated for what they're adding to the space. So I definitely think there's going to be more talk about money and finances and entrepreneurship we're also seeing this rise of like ugc content creators and then just just push on making money making money making money in this space and less so much about the products and more about the back end i think that's gonna what we're gonna see more of that's interesting do you think then like content won't matter as much or it's still gonna matter I think it's still going to matter, but I think it's going to be less about maybe products and more about the people and who they are as a whole in the creator space. But I definitely think the products are still going to be a critical part. It just in general, in the brand side, at least you're always going to have someone selling a product. That's just capitalism one on one. It's (laughs) always going to be a part of that. Um, and then I also think when it comes to an audience, because so many people want to be an influencer creator right now, they are looking for the resources on how to do that. So I definitely think there's going to be a rise of education and information on garnering a, a career and an income um, in this space. So what's next for Tiara? Like where I know that you have your master class. Definitely plug that and tell our listeners where they can, I guess, pre-sign up for it in case yeah. they're not already there. And if they're listening yeah. to this once to sign up, like where they can go and get the replays of that stuff. And then let us yeah. know what's up for you next. Like what's on the horizon for you? Yeah. So what the platform is gonna be on. So you can follow your creator BFF on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. 
Um, it's all going to be on there. And that's when we're going to officially announce the class. Like all of the education and resources that I'm going to have for creators is going to be on that platform. So the masterclass is already filmed and edited. It's just a simple course. It's going to be on Teachable and you can watch it in your pajamas while you're doing laundry, whatever. It's pre-recorded um, and it has subtitles. So if you want to listen to on the train or, or anything like that, you can do that as well. And it should be coming out very, very soon, hopefully within the next two weeks or so. Um, but for that announcement, you could follow your creator BFF. And then of course on my platforms, which is the Tiara Willis everywhere, I'm going to announce it there as well. So that's going to be really exciting. It's going to be the first installment of this, of this, uh, source for education and resources and stuff like that. So there's going to be more of that, more classes, more templates, and just more education as we really just develop it. But we're just starting with the master class, and then it's going to develop even more. It's really going to have a life of itself outside of me and my face. It's going to be a hub for education and resources for everybody. So that's really exciting. And I'm really happy about that. And then also for this year on my personal side is doing some long term partnerships and being in house experts and in house experts since I am a licensed esthetician. So I'm excited about that. That should be announced very soon. I'm going to be doing it with the brand that is amazing that a lot of people associate with me that I've worked with since day one. I'm going to be their in house expert. So that's going to be um, exciting. I love that. You know, I forgot to ask you, how did those, you know, degrees that you got come back and to help you out? So being a licensed esthetician, and did you ever go to cosmetology school after that and become a licensed cosmetologist as well? Or No, because cosmetology is mostly hair. And I'm just personally, that's just not something I'm interested in. So it's very small amount of makeup. So aesthetics is still the same. It's mostly skincare. And makeup because also too, I really started wearing makeup because I had acne and dark spots. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to figure out how to clear my skin just selfishly. And then that turned into really a passion and love for it. And now being able to help other people clear their skin investments. And I'm thinking long term because especially in my career, in my space is very volatile. So I'm thinking of different avenues where I can have something that's sustainable. And then another thing I get, again, it's just that work-life balance. I think we have this very toxic hustle culture that's going on, especially on social media. We're constantly seeing people's wins, people making a million dollar business or this and that going here, getting these cars and all that stuff. And we feel like we're constantly chasing some type of limit or some type of expectation that does not exist. So I think one, like also being realistic, but then also finding balance, because if you keep striving for that, you're going to burn out. And now you're no good to anybody. I love that. Thank you so much, Tiara, for sharing this with our audience. Um, I know I said last question, but this is truly the last question. <laughs> okay. What keeps you going when you feel like giving up? Because I know there might be days where you're like, this is hard. What did I get myself yeah. into? Like, this industry is crazy. Maybe you don't think that. But what's that nugget or what's that fuel for you, that inner fuel that keeps your, your engine ignited? I would say one of the hardest things of my job, and this is very specific, is just dealing with hate and negativity. Every single day, I got people calling me out my name. Like that is just a normal experience. Imagine that. Like you gotta have tough skin. I don't know if I could do that. The girls don't like me. Turn my for a very long time. (laughs) For a very long time, it was super difficult for for me and just dealing with this, especially being young. And I have like grown women writing and blogs rumors about me like that is so different difficult to deal with when you're such a at an impressionable age so that really affects me I've cried I've had like days of just really bad anxiety where all of my notifications are people just hating on me and just being really mean and really critical and it's a lot because being on my phone is my job but if everything I'm seeing on my phone is just people being mean that's hard. Like I'm trying to do what I need to do, but you can't just ignore that. And it's, it's a unnatural experience being an influencer because in your life, maybe you've had at most 10 bad experiences. Someone saying mean, being mean or anything like that, but online it's hundreds, it's thousands. That's unnatural. So how do you 
deal with that. And that is what hurts people the most and really devastates their mental health is just dealing with negativity and hate. So for me, how I try to deal with that is one, giving myself breaks and allowing myself to step away and just regroup and ground myself. And then also to learning how to manage a crisis, really PR and media training on how to properly respond to things, when to apologize, when you when you shouldn't defend yourself, when you need to just know who you are and be confident in yourself and know who you are as a person. And while someone may take something one way, you have to be sure of yourself on on your of your own integrity. So I've also stopped trying to prove myself um, as much as I used to. And then three, just remember all the positivity that comes your way. I am so incredibly grateful for the audience that I have. They are the reason why I'm in this position today. So focusing on that love and support that I already have and people that have throughout years have known to give me grace, even when I'm wrong or even when I didn't say the right thing at that one time, remembering that, that the love is really louder and more important than that also very aggressive minority. Uh, well, thank you for sharing that. I know it's like, it's just something I think Sorry. about. Like, just even think about people who have more followers than you, like celebrities. I don't know how they do it. I would just post and never look at my phone again, right? Um, so you have to build that tough skin, but also know what you're doing and what you're building is way bigger than these one per not one, but you know, these multiples of people's hate comments people who have the time to sit there and write something mean about something they don't someone they don't know i'll never understand it's like why do you waste your energy right so yeah what i have learned or to be more compassionate towards that is just talking to people who did that and i even asked when i opened a discussion on twitter i was like just be honest have you ever left a hate comment before and why and people were like yeah when I was young and I was just angsty and angry and during that time which all of us experience so understand that people that leave those comments sometimes they're just struggling internally and they're just putting that energy out and I even had a friend who told me she left a hate comment under an influencer's post and she admitted that during that time I was struggling like I was having a really hard time with myself So being a little bit more compassionate, realizing that people who respond like that, they may be going through something personally and it's not you, it's them. And they're just having a hard time. I can, I can, I can hear that, but still it's me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you once again, Tiara. I really hope that our dream drivers enjoyed this conversation. Check out your masterclass, check out your creator BFF and your own personal Instagram and social media pages. This has just been so enlightening, even for me. I have notes here, too, that I'm going to start thinking about, like these usage and um, <laughs> you know, those usage rights and licensing. Hmm, how can I make more money off of like the stuff I'm doing with my podcast on that, on that realm? So thank you once again, girl. You're welcome. I really enjoyed this discussion. Thank you so much for having me. All right, so that's a wrap for this episode of Dreams and Drive. I hope you enjoyed our guest's dream driving journey as well as listening to their keys to success. If you love this episode, you know what to do. Please make sure that you are following us. We are at Dreams and Drive across social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So make sure you're sharing this episode, posting it to your Instagram stories, texting it to a friend, sharing on LinkedIn, wherever you are or online. Just pay this forward and share this with somebody. We really appreciate it. And all the sharing that you do helps us grow our community. If you want to join our email newsletter, The Keys, and get weekly updates delivered to your inbox, just go to dreamsanddrive.com slash join. That's dreamsanddrive.com slash join. And lastly, if you know somebody who would be great for this show, or if you are someone who would be great for this show, please go to dreamsanddrive.com slash pitch. I'm always accepting new guests. I'm always accepting new pitches. So I love to see those pitch requests coming in. Keep dreaming, keep driving, and we'll chat again in the next episode. Bye, guys.